Hello, everybody. I want to extend a really warm welcome to all of you joining us tonight for this Facebook Live event. I'm really glad that you decided to tune in as we engage in a really meaningful and interesting conversation around the topic of hoarding. So my name is Danny Torrance, and I currently work in the HR department of Liberty Resources. We're a center of independent living that helps people with disabilities live independently in the community. Um, and I've had the privilege of working closely with JSCS over the last five years as a part of the Philadelphia Hoarding Task Force. So joining me tonight um, is Dara Leinweber. She's the Hoarding Program Coordinator at JSCS. We also have Jasmine Romero, Hoarding Care Manager, and Courtney Owen, Director of Individual and Family Services. And we have Deborah Bornstein, Director of Events and Donor Operations, monitoring our Facebook feed. So we really encourage you guys to send in any questions and engage with us throughout this conversation. And we'll take some time at the end to make sure that we go over your questions and continue the conversation. So our conversation tonight is really going to be a kickoff to an exciting web series that JFCS is hosting on the topic of hoarding. So before we dive fully into our discussion tonight, Courtney, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the web series? Sure. So every year with the Philadelphia Hoarding Task Force, JFCS partners to sponsor an annual conference. And this year, because of the pandemic, we're unable to do that in person. Therefore, we've put together a really great three-part web series, and we're featuring three really amazing speakers who have a long-standing history and knowledge and expertise in hoarding disorder. So we're starting it off with our September 11th um, speaker, Gail Stichetti, and she's going to be talking to us about motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy around hoarding intervention. And then we're going to have Michael Tomlinson, who is talking to us about um, when is safe, safe enough? Really talking about a harm reduction approach to hoarding. And then we're also gonna be featuring um, our third speaker, Judy Battalion, who's gonna be talking about hoarding, anti-hoarding and the search for home as somebody who grew up in a hoarded home. So we're really excited about these three great speakers and we're offering CEUs. So join us for our web series. There'll be more information on our website and Facebook about that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I figured at this point, let's go ahead and dive in. We have lots of great topics and questions to go over. And so for tonight, I figured this would maybe be a helpful starting place. I'd love to know why you think this is an important topic for us to cover tonight. Why should we talk about hoarding? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hoarding is something that really impacts a large amount of people in our population. We, we think about it um, or don't hear about it that often. It's not something that we normally talk about in our daily lives, but it impacts two to 6% of the population. So to give you some perspective, that's between 23 and 59,000 people in Philadelphia alone, just in the city of Philadelphia. So we think about that and how close people live together in high rises and apartments. Um, it has a huge impact on each other and it also has an impact on the communities that they surround. Um, so that's one of the main reasons. Uh, another reason we wanna talk about it is really to reduce the stigma. It's one of the key reasons that we talk about it. We provide education around it. Um, and we really just wanna normalize it and create safe spaces so that we can um, encourage people to come out and share what their needs are, join our groups, have individual uh, services and supports through JFCS. It's such a huge thing um, to create these safe environments where people can really open up and talk about it, whether they're the individual who is impacted by hoarding disorder, they're the family members, maybe their neighbors, um, landlords, fire department, police. It really, it impacts so much of our communities that we wanna talk about it and really um, provide the education so we know what to do, how to intervene and who are our local experts. Um, so those are some of the key reasons that we're talking about it and I think uh, throughout this conversation, we'll keep talking about how important it is and, and how we can make a difference. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much. You know, and one thing that I've been thinking a lot about recently is uh, how hoarding disorder might be similar and different to some of the other mental health disorders. I was wondering if you could go into that a little bit more. How is it similar and how might it be different? Um, so, Yes. So as far as um, similarities with other mental health disorders, um, hoarding disorder is classified as its own distinct issue as a mental health disorder, um, which is fairly new starting in 2013 with the most recent DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. 
Um, so that just started in 2013, rather than being clumped in as um, a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. So this new recognition that this is a standalone issue that somebody can experience. Um, and I do want to talk about just briefly the, the five key components of hoarding disorder that are used to um, as the diagnosis. So the major, major um, criteria is difficulty discarding. There are strong emotions attached to discarding possessions. Um, the, and the next one would be an accumulation of possessions that prevent the normal use of space. So we're talking about um, not being able to use a bed or to cook on your stovetop or in your oven or other major um, uh, areas of your home that you would be using for other purposes because of the amount of possessions, you're no longer to use those spaces. Um, another criteria is the distress or impairment that the actual behavior leads to. So um, there has to be an actual, uh, really uh, somebody feeling negative, strong negative feelings about discarding, getting rid of their possessions. Um, and, or an impairment, like the, uh, not being able to use a bathroom, not being able to invite friends and family or um, service providers or repair people into their homes. That's gonna lead to a major just um, impairment. Um, and uh, other, other criteria that are used is that it's not associated with another mental health disorder. So they can exist at the same time somebody can experience, for example, um, bipolar disorder or uh, ADD, but the hoarding in itself um, is a standalone issue. And that's very important to remember. Um, and that it's not related to a medical issue. So we have situational hoarding that can occur. Say somebody comes home from a hip replacement surgery um, and they may have a collection of items, but that collection, I shouldn't say collection, um, that accumulation of possessions is a direct result of their inability to physically move their mobility at that point, um, not because of a deeper um, emotional issue, mental health condition. Um, so those are the major criteria. It's also important to remember that insight is very important. A lot of folks who suffer with hoarding disorder don't aren't aware that this is affecting their lives and they don't, they're not aware that it's affecting the people around them the same way um, that the folks around them are seeing it or experiencing it and they've learned to cope. So it's, they don't see it as an issue. Um, so those are some major differences there um, from other mental health disorders. I would just add to that because of a lack of insight sometimes, it can also impact motivation or where you start with the person. And so the treatment for hoarding disorder can often be lengthy um, and sometimes can be more intensive. And so we often ask that when people join our programs that they're really patient with themselves, they're patient with their family members because it can be really time consuming and take a long time to work through this process. It didn't happen overnight and you're not gonna fix it overnight. There is no quick fix. It's truly that mental health component and the pathology behind it that impacts us. And, you know, we're learning new behaviors to overcome that. And it takes time and it takes practice. And we often use the term like practice muscle that we got from the Buried in Treasures book. And it's so true. The more you practice it, the more you um, get better at working on those skills and thinking about it every day and stop focusing on the negative and start focusing on the positive. Yeah, that's really good to think about. And, you know, with both of your responses, like, it's making me think how important it is to really focus on the person and not just the stuff. I'm um, thinking about hoarding as a mental health condition. Um, you can't just look at the accumulation. Uh, you have to really understand uh, the emotional component of hoarding too, right? Absolutely. Um, so this is great to think about. Um, you know, and because it's a relatively new disorder in the DSM, it seems like a lot more people are starting to talk about it and especially with the TV shows these days, you know, I've heard a lot of people mention hoarding because they saw it on TV. I'd love to maybe hear a little bit more from you. Um, what do you think the TV shows are getting right? How is that helpful? 
And are there ways that maybe the TV shows are miscategorizing hoarding? Or is there anything that it's getting wrong? So basically um, what you've seen on TV, what they're getting right, um, a lot of the times you'll see um, those people um, have had some type of past trauma in their lives. Um, there's usually, you know, a story to go along with it that they kind of delve into. Um, and uh, it usually started a long time ago, but what you're looking at on TV is usually an adult. Um, and the reason for that is because when these people were younger, sometimes it was kept in check by a caregiver or a parent. Um, and um, so that's why you're seeing more adults than um, younger people with a disorder um, on TV. Um, another thing that the TV show is getting right, um, although it's kind of, uh, they're, they're creating awareness, but it's through bad publicity. But I guess, you know, um, you know getting awareness out there is still, is still good through the TV show. Some things that um, the TV shows that are portraying that are wrong, um, they're portraying each person um, as kind of unsanitary or dirty, and it's furthering the stigma that, you know, those with, um, you know, hoarding disorder um, all are the same, and they're not. Um, and they also don't focus a lot on the mental health component part of, you um, hoarding disorder and they don't offer much post-show support or they don't talk about um, if these individuals are getting that support after the show ends. Mm. And, and I, yeah and I, I think also the shows what you see on the shows are you have a person with who's struggling with hoarding disorder and often you're seeing um, homes that have really high levels of clutter and then you're watching them do this process of, of what we call a clean out and we don't recommend cleanouts. We don't do cleanouts. Typically, it would be a very rare situation where we would do a cleanout for somebody. Um, that in, in and of itself can often be very traumatic for somebody, especially when they're done without the person present. On the show, the person is often there with family members or some other support. Um, and but nonetheless, cleanouts can be very traumatic. And usually, like ninety. 6% of the time when you do a clean out, the level of clutter will come back to the same amount or worse within six to nine months. So we don't recommend that. What we would do is teach the person um, a skill set through behavior, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or some other um, harm reduction technique to really help them understand why am I hoarding? How can I sort through my things and help them work through it so that it's a long term solution rather than a quick fix that isn't going to help the longevity of the situation. I think when there are times when safety is really a huge component, and we see that a lot in our program because we serve older adults, um, that then we might do something that called a, like a safety day where we would do a supported clean out and they would very much be a part of it. And, and it takes a lot of time to implement something like that, where we would work with the person and really have a solid plan for the day. They would very much be a part of it and we would take breaks and check in and all of those things. Um, and, and that person would be on board with it. They would be a part of the process, part of the team to work with it. Um, so I, I think that one of the things that to add to what Jasmine was saying is that cleanouts typically are not something that we would recommend um, and are usually only needed in very um, significant situations where safety is just not an option. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like to really do some meaningful work in the field of hoarding, it takes time and commitment <clears throat> and learning new skills and building trust and working as a team. Um, it's kind of a longer process where maybe just an hour long TV show can't quite capture, you know, all of the, the steps along the way. To yeah. Really support. Absolutely. And I think she touched on something else that was really important. Um, you know, a lot of times when you look at the show, think about it, they're, they're approaching it for viewership. They want to kind of give you that shock factor. Um, so when you look at people with hoarded homes, they're not always uh, one to the level of clutter that they are in the show, and they're not always unsanitary. So you have sort of um, homes that are hoarded and homes that are unsanitary, and sometimes they overlap, but they don't always. So a hoarded home isn't always an unsanitary home. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And so it creates this stigma that hoarding is dirty or unclean. Um, and that's 
it's not always true. Um, a lot of times we go into homes where people have a lot of organized clutter and it's very neat and tidy and in organizational bins and people know exactly where the things are that, they, um, that they're looking for at any moment in any given time. And so those are things that we have to really um, just redirect and educate people on. Mm. That's really helpful to draw those distinctions. Uh, and I think one other distinction people tend to make is the difference between a collection and hoarding. What might, how would you define the dif difference there? So basically collections are something that you can take pride in and you display and you normally show off. Um, think, I don't know, uh, baseball cards in a binder. Um, they're all in one place. They're very neatly organized or something, I don't know, that's on shelves like uh, glass bottles or something like that. That will be considered um, a collection, whereas um, clutter would be uh, temporary or short-lived. And it's something like um, if you just had like a, a, a baby and um, you're still getting used to, you know, having... A, another person around and all of their things and you just have to get into the groove and routine of um, you know placing things organizing things and um, hoarding would be long term um, it's a mental health disorder um, it's an inability to utilize the space that you have uh, for its intended purposes so for example um, you normally would use your kitchen for cooking, but over time, other items that normally probably would not be in a kitchen make their way into the kitchen and um, utilize space that it's not intended for. Um, so that would be the differences between collections, clutter, and hoarding. Great. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so I'm really curious to know uh, who is hoarding? Um, are more people likely to be at risk? Who do we typically see um, developing hoarding behaviors? So the one thing about hoarding is that it doesn't discriminate. Um, anybody can develop hoarding disorder. We do see in, again, like Dara was talking about the diagnosis and how it's fairly new. And so we do lack some research on it. Um, I think that's true about mental health in general. We don't always know where it comes from. But the one thing that we do see with hoarding is possibly there's some research out there that there's a genetic component, um, more to come on that. And we also know that a lot of times the people that um, struggle with hoarding disorder have a family member or somebody in their extended family who have struggled with hoarding disorder and or have grown up in a hoarded home um, can all be factors that, that help people develop hoarding disorder. I think the other thing is sometimes we see it based in trauma or maybe a traumatic life event that happens that people are using hoarding for safety or they're concerned um, about access to that. Someone like who maybe went through the Great Depression and experienced a loss of many things or not having access to things might now sort of have this coping strategy of needing to have these things around them at all times. So I think there's there are different reasons why people might develop hoarding disorder but we don't always know what the exact answer is. We can just say based off of the current research that these are some warning signs. Um, you know, people will say, oh, I see it more in females versus males. I, I don't think there's enough research out there at this point to say which is more accurate. Um, and sometimes, you know, it really depends on different factors of, of where people are living or where they're coming from. Uh, so socioeconomic status can also be a factor because somebody who's living in subsidized housing where their home is being inspected by the property every year might be more easily identified than somebody who has their own home. It's not attached to anybody um, and they have more space to kind of hide their clutter or finances to buy storage units or things like that to be able to kind of put their um, hoarding out of plain sight might be able to um, hide it. So we might see it more in lower socioeconomic statuses, but it's not necessarily occurring more in that way. Um, we also see it a lot in older adults, like aging populations 55 and over, because um, as Jasmine was referring to, teenagers, even though signs and warning signs can start as early as adolescence, they often have somebody there kind of keeping them in check, kind of making them clean up after themselves or removing things from the home and then it, you know, it takes time to collect enough clutter to make um, your spaces unusable for their intended purpose. And so that's a lot of times why we see it in older individuals. And, you know, 
they say every decade that it goes untreated creates, um, you know, a higher level of clutter. So those are some of the ways that we might identify it in the in older populations, even though the symptomatology is still there in the in the younger um, populations. All right, before we move on to the next question, I want to just remind people, if you have questions you'd love to ask, feel free to type it into the Facebook group and we'll make sure we save some time for that at the end. Um, but, you know, I would be curious to know a little bit more about um, the reasons that people have a difficult time in letting go of their things. Um, why, why, do you, why might it be difficult for people with hoarding behaviors to declutter? So there's a lot of different reasons why, um, but some of them are sentimental reasons. Um, losing items mean losing a memory that's attached to it and a feeling that's attached to it. Um, another reason might be a guilt of waste or um, like, you know, not wanting to throw something out because it can be useful later. I think we've all been there. Um, and an interesting one is something called anthropomorphism. I hope I said that right. Um, so basically what that is, anthropomorphism, um, it's attaching um, kind of like a human quality to um, an inanimate object. So if you have a pen and it's run out of ink, but you're apologizing to it um, and you feel sorry for throwing it away, um, that would qualify as anthropomorphism. Um, and there's also memories and feelings like the item um, uh, and the item that's attached to the memory. Uh, then there's also distress and anxiety um, and letting go of an item or, um, you know, not wanting to, or when you're in the store and you're purchasing or taking an item. So there can be some anxiety with that as well. Um, and again, the traumatic life event, um, it could be a loss of a loved one. Um, a catastrophic event such as a hurricane or an earthquake. Um, so there's sense of safety and uh, there's some depression. Um, it can also be an event such as um, the Holocaust or um, some other traumatic life event. Um, and then a newer trauma like um, the, the pandemic right now um, can trigger um, trauma, which would lead a lot of people to have a hard time letting go. Mm. That makes sense. And I think with uh, the pandemic right now, a lot of us are feeling, you know, a little bit more anxious, um, a little bit more worried, depressed um, over certain events. So, um, you know, I'm really curious to know, how do you guys think that the current pandemic is influencing hoarding right now? Is there a connection there? How does that manifesting? Yeah, that's a great question. I, it's, I think more to come on that. We'll, we'll keep learning more and more as we go, but the pandemic has been a triggering event for all of us and something that we didn't foresee and that we weren't sure of how we were gonna experience it. But I do think it has allowed us to kind of see and maybe even at times feel something that somebody who is hoarding might feel when they're able, going to the store and they feel like they're in need of something and they're not able to access it or um, they feel like they need something in excess because you know we might have been there at the grocery store buying 700 rolls of toilet paper and unsure of what was to come or you know, filling our Amazon carts and then we didn't, we weren't able to get something for months and months because it, it wasn't there. And that fear and anxiety of not knowing when are we gonna be able to get this or are we gonna be able to get this? Uh, what happens if I don't have this um, feeling? And so I think this, this particular situation has kind of put us all in that spot to, to relate in some way. Um, if you did go out and purchase a bunch of toilet paper or sanitary supplies, that does not make you somebody who's struggling with hoarding disorder. I want to be very clear about that. Um, it was strictly situational and something that we all could not be prepared for. But I do think that it just exacerbates the, the symptomatology of somebody who has hoarding disorder and maybe that fear, um, the desire to acquire more or... Um, have the comorbidity. You know, we talk a lot with the pandemic about isolation and depression and not having the connectivity to other people. And so, you know, that in itself can be additional triggers for everybody, but especially somebody who's already struggling potentially. So all of those things could just create a situation where somebody might um, want to go out and get more stuff or not able to go out and get more stuff. And that in itself could be causing a lot of distress. Mm. Right. Yeah, I can see where, you know, a lot of the current events, um, you know, can be interrelated with hoarding and uh, make it even more challenging for a lot of folks. Um, 
So yeah, this has all been really helpful to start understanding what hoarding is and learning a little bit more about it. I'd love to shift gears a little bit and talk about how can we help. So I'd love to know what you're doing at JSDS. What are some of your services, your programs, and how do you work with people that have hoarding behaviors? Yes, well, thanks for asking, Danny, because we are actively working on creating um, a robust hoarding program at JFCS. We see that there is definitely a lack of support that exists um, for this for this disorder. So, a um, few different levels of support we have. We do have individual support for folks who are 65 years and over. Um, that would involve uh, a care manager, one of one of us, Courtney, myself, or Jasmine, working one on one with that person um, to create a plan that works for them and for them to learn some skills and um, uh, for us to be there to um, learn about them. Not so much their possessions, but it does come into play, of course. Um, so the one on one service. Um, we also have, um, we're running a group now uh, called Buried in Treasures, and Buried in Treasures is a 16-week long workshop that is based off of a book, I apologize my computer just beeped, um, based off a book called Buried in Treasures by Randy Frost and Gail Steckety, and um, this workshop uh, right now, and also as a note, because due to COVID, um, we are not going into folks' homes. So um, we've gotten very creative with technology to be able to still provide the services that we were. Um, so Buried in Treasure, 16 weeks long. We meet on Zoom. We are starting two new groups um, in, on September 16th with an info session on September 9th. So please check out um, uh, jfcsphilly.org for details on that, um, or to give us a call at um, our care navigation line for information. Um, we also offer a mindfulness and hoarding group. So again, Zoom-based, and this is a group that is led by one of our, um, our therapists and it's based in um, mindfulness stress-based reduction. So this, <clears throat> excuse me, a um, lot of movement exercises, a lot of grounding exercises, breathing exercises to help folks um, increase their skills on um, uh, visualization and um, just finding a piece of calm during the day. Um, we also have an art therapy group for folks with hoarding. And uh, this group is um, led by our uh, art therapist. And uh, this group helps folks to think of creative ways, um, an outlet to express the feelings that they have in a different way than more of the, um, the talk therapy uh, modality. And um, that, that pretty much sums up the support for now. <laughs> yeah, so please, if anyone ever has any questions about um, different ways to connect, to get help for yourself or for someone you love or a friend, um, you know, please reach out. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, you weren't kidding. You're building a really robust hoarding program. So okay. That's very exciting. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I would imagine there might be a few people tuning in tonight who uh, might know of somebody with hoarding behaviors, maybe as a, f a friend or a family member, um, and they might be wondering what they can do to help. Do you have any suggestions about that? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is avoid power struggles at all costs. Um, it's just not worth it and you're not gonna get anywhere. You know, when we go into people's homes, we're coming from a different perspective, but even a family member going in, um, when you look at the item that somebody has in their home, you might think like, oh, this is not something you need to keep. This might be trash or we, you know, we can recycle this, we can donate this. Um, but we don't know and understand necessarily what that item means to the person who has ownership over it. And so we're, we wanna avoid that power struggle of, oh, just throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. You don't need that, you don't need that. And that person is gonna feel defensive and wanna just hold on even tighter to it. Instead, we want to go in and ask them, how do they want us to help them? 
think about the fact that you're going into somebody else's personal space and you're talking about their items, things that are very near and dear to them. And so we want to ask them, you know, very, very consciously, how can I help you? And then honor that, you know, that's the, it's really easy to slip back into, oh, you don't need this or to sneak something that you think is trash into the bag and think they won't see or know, but they do um, as you would if somebody was in your home throwing something out um, or taking it out of the home. And so, you know, I think we really just want to be mindful of, of the fact that we're, we really want to be respectful of who we're working with, no matter what the relationship is. And also, if you're the support person, take breaks. It can be really stressful for you as the support person, and you can feel things like burnout or um, just anxiety or stress or fear about what's happening to your loved one. And so make sure that you take breaks and seek out support for yourself because it's a really challenging situation at times, and it can often feel like you're in a loop of having a win and then taking two steps back and then having another win and taking two steps back and no that's often how the process goes. We often make a lot of um, successful movements forward and then one or two steps back and we work through that rather than fight it um, and judge it, you know, that, but it is really hard as an onlooker sometimes to be mindful of that. And so we, we really encourage people to do that. And some of the key ways you can do that is, um, you know, call us if you need some support, but also there's a lot of really great books and resources out there and if you check out the philadelphiahoarding.org website, they have a lot of books and recommendations and resources. There is also the OCD Foundation website. They have a lot of information. Um, just, just educating yourself on what is hoarding disorder and how does this person um, view their belongings can really give you some insight on how to interact with them. Yeah, thanks for sharing all those resources. I mean, I will say I've utilized the Philadelphia Hoarding Task Force website a lot myself to the point where it was on one of my frequently visited websites <laughs> on my computer. So there's a ton of information out there. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, I think we're getting towards the end of our time together. So I'd love to know if there are any questions from Facebook that we can now address and answer. We are getting a lot of questions. I hope that we have time to hit all of them, but let's see how long the answers are. Um, the first question I have is, we have a couple of questions from folks who have people in their neighborhood who's, who appear to be hoarding and it's, you know, fire hazards and whatnot for the nearby homes. Is there um, a resource or what should you do if that's happening near where you live? Yeah, so I'll start and then um, Dara and Jasmine can fill in. But, you know, it is tough. And one of the, the hardest parts about it is that people have the right to their own free will. Um, and so sometimes while there are ways that we can intervene, we can't always force treatment on somebody. And that makes it really challenging. Some of the things that you can do is call protective services if that person is putting themselves at risk or not. Um, or putting their neighbors at risk for their community, which is why we talk so much and try to provide so much education about hoarding disorder because it does it doesn't just impact the person who is living with it it impacts the entire community um, especially in a city like Philadelphia where we live in row homes and high rises and apartment complexes where if one person in the building is hoarding and a fire breaks out it could be a really um, detrimental issue if if somebody then has um, an infestation issue or something of that nature or an odor develops or something. Um, it's not just impacting them now, it's starting to impact our neighbors. So, you know, calling adult protective services for somebody who is under 60, calling older adult protective services for somebody who's over 60, and they can go out, assess the situation and try to, um, you know, they're, an, they're more of an enforcement agency. We are not an enforcement agency. Um, you can also call 311. That's sort of like the number one step to make and just keep making reports. Again, um, a lot of those calls end up going to places like older adult protective services or um, adult protective services. You know, those are some things you can also, um, one, just get more information for yourself so that maybe you could talk to that person and, and say, hey, I have some resources for you. Would you be interested? Because if they feel a connection or a trust and they don't feel judged, they might be more open to having a conversation about it. And that's a lot of times where we want to connect with that person because like Dara said early on, a lot of times people with hoarding don't have um, a level of insight where they're understanding the impact maybe that they have on themselves or somebody else. So we need to find that trusted connection where we can build rapport, 
and then get them um, some sort of treatment or intervention. And there's a lot of, um, you know, therapists or services in the area, including ours at JFCS, that we can get people involved in. And just real quick to add to what everything Courtney just said, um, for <clears throat> neighbors concerned, um, just, I know it's hard, um, especially when the clutter reaches the outside of the home, but try to remember, this is not something, if somebody is experiencing hoarding disorder, this is not something that they're doing intentionally to, um, to, to you. It's, it's not a slight, it's not something they're doing out of spite. Um, it is something that they are probably very ashamed of um, and just uh, to, to try to dig, dig in deep and be as compassionate as possible can really make a big difference. That is an incredible answer. Um, I have an, the next question I have is when is helping someone actually helpful and when is it enabling? Hmm. I can take a stab. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, I would say that, uh, for instance, help versus enabling, um, one of the biggest things that pops into my head is if you are helping somebody pay for a storage unit, that's not really help. Um, it is more enabling because that, as we talked about before, the less that's in somebody's purview right in front of them, they're not seeing it, it allows them to continue the behavior. Um, so it, it is not um, very helpful. Um, help is, uh, surprisingly enough, just listening sometimes. Um, oh, what, what, and being patient. Um, trying to find professionals that have some experience with this disorder and know about it specifically. Um, trying to get them connected. Uh, um, to a book or a workshop, helping them get connected to the technology to be able to participate in those workshops. Or um, if we're talking about an older adult, not that all older adults don't know how to use the internet, we know that you do. Um, but for folks out there that maybe you want to help your parent buy a book, you know, order it for them um, and have it mailed directly to their home. There are plenty of ways to be supportive. Um, without enabling. Um, I would also like to add that um, you could be enabling by when you realize that you're doing most of the work for them hands-on or even um, just in discussion. Um, I find that now because we're not able to go into the home when we're having discussions with our clients, um, a lot of the time they'll ask, well, what do you think I should do? Um, and I think that you have to be really careful with that um, for many reasons. Um, and one of them being you want them to be able to kind of think on their own as well and just kind of guide them, but not give them the answers that they're looking for or tell them, well, if it were me, this is what I would do because it's not helpful in the end. That's not what we're, we're trying to do. So um, I think those are some ways that, you know, that could be enabling and not helpful. Yeah, I think that's a really key point because, you know, when we make decisions on the behalf of somebody else, that can sometimes come back in not a great way. Um, sometimes people might feel like we made the decision for them and they really wanted that item. And then what happens? They might be upset or miss it or regret it. Um, and we also want people to feel empowered to make the decisions and, and to work through it. it. It helps to build up that practice muscle. I love, I love that term. Um, the final question, um, we actually have two that are relatively similar, but I guess they're slightly different. One is if you have a family member that is, um, ex you know, having a uh, hoarding type behaviors, specifically a child, do you have any special words of wisdom about that? Hmm. Specifically a child. I think it's, um, so when you see somebody, a child who might be, you know, having a really strong attachment to their items or their objects, um, or maybe really strong reactions when if you throw something away that was theirs or you clean up and they can't find an item and then they're really upset um, and they miss that item, there are definitely ways that you can help that person. One is just to talk to them and find out like, what's going on? What was your feeling with that, with that item? Um, tell me about that item. Where did you get it from? What does it mean to you? Um, so that way you can better understand what their attachment is. And from there, you know, it could just be ongoing conversations. 
or it could be that you maybe reach out to somebody who specializes um, in child therapy and really connect them with someone so that they can better process it and help teach them skills. Because as we know, with all mental health disorders, the sooner you can get somebody help, the better their long-term outcome is going to be. So we always want to encourage that. Um, and it's really hard, especially if you're a parent or a family member mm. with a child who might be struggling with something, to, to disconnect the emotional side of yourself from that. Mm. So I, I think always reaching out to getting more support. And, you know, again, you can always reach out to the JSBS and we can help direct you to the proper places or to, to a good um therapist or counselor for a child. This has been great. I do have one more question, if we can squeeze one more in. The question has been specifically about food hoarding, if that is um, a type of hoarding. And um, I think I just wanted just some more information about that. And then that'll be our last question, just because we're running out of time. Sure. So food hoarding, um, we see, we. We sort of refer to it as object hoarding. So you see object hoarding a lot more often than you see something like animal hoarding. Typically what we would see here is uh, people with object hoarding. And so it could be food, it could be newspapers, it could be anything. Um, we wouldn't say it's food hoarding specifically versus paper hoarding versus newspaper yeah. hoarding. Um, it would be considered object hoarding. And so, yeah, we do see that. And, and again, it could be for a multitude of reasons. It could be because that person maybe um, experienced a time in their life or their childhood where they didn't have enough food and they developed this fear and now it's a safety thing and a defense mechanism to have so much food that they don't ever run out and we see this with our clients we do um you know we'll go and we see like um like a, a large stock of food from the food pantries that they just keep going and getting for this fear that they'll run out and it's not to be um in any way negatively impact somebody else but just this fear and need desire to have that for their own safety and sense of control um, over their own food supply. But that could be true about newspapers or pictures mm -hmm. or other papers as well. Yeah, I would just add to that real quick with food hoarding, because um, we do try to come at, at from an, um, a perspective of harm reduction. Um, we don't, nobody expects perfection. It takes years and years, as Courtney said earlier, to develop this. It's not something that's going to end overnight. Um, so uh maybe even just having um a rule about um a certain date you know looking at expiration dates and using that as a guideline um can be helpful uh rather than um actually putting a number on amounts um, yeah that's a great that's a great guideline that's really helpful yeah and i remember years ago um when you were going through some training on hoarding that um, one recommendation uh, one of the researchers said was, is there anybody you can even reach out to that's in your support system? If you're running low on food, is there somebody in your network that can help bring you over a night's nice meal? So I think kind of finding that support system can be really helpful too. Uh -huh. Absolutely, yeah. Well, this has been great. We have so many thank yous also in the comments. I just wanted to share that as well. So. Great. Well, thank you uh, for everybody on this call. Uh, we're so glad that you tuned in and that you were part of this conversation. Um, we hope you found it really enjoyable and interesting, and you can take a few nuggets away from this. And we do want to put in just a quick plug for uh, the web series that's coming up. So uh, you can find more information online. I think the URL is jfcsphilly.org slash from challenge to hope. Um, it's, in the, it's in the comments. The link is, I put the link in the comments oh, so anybody okay. can find it. Perfect. So yeah, um, you know, tune in. The first one is September 11th with Gail Steckity, and she's a phenomenal speaker. So we hope that you can join us for that. Um, so yeah, unless there's anything else, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all again, and enjoy your night, and be well. Thank you. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs>